the world is full of mysteries. But as we push further into our technological age, that shroud is quickly growing thinner. Still, though, there are a few mysteries left, and that is what's truly creepy. We asked our readers to comb the internet for some frightening mysteries that, despite our best attempts, remain unsolved to this day. The winner is below, but first the runners up, 23. Death of Elisa Lam. The body of Elisa Lam, also known by her Cantonese name, a Canadian student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, was recovered from a water tank atop the Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles on February 19, 2013. She had been reported missing at the beginning of the month. Maintenance workers at the hotel discovered the body when investigating guest complaints of problems with the water supply. Her disappearance had been widely reported, interest had increased five days prior to her body's discovery when the Los Angeles Police Department released video of the last time she was known to have been seen, on the day of her disappearance, by an elevator security camera. In this footage, Lam is seen exiting and re-entering the elevator talking and gesturing in the hallway outside, and sometimes seeming to hide within the elevator, which itself appears to be malfunctioning. The video went viral on the internet, with many viewers reporting that they found it unsettling. Explanations ranged from claims of paranormal involvement to the bipolar disorder from which Lam suffered, it has also been argued that the video was altered prior to release. The circumstances of Lam's death when she was found, also raised questions, especially in light of the Cecil's history in relation to other notable deaths and murders. Her body was naked five, with most of her clothes and personal effects floating in the water near her. It took the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office four months, after repeated delays, to release the autopsy report, which reports no evidence of physical trauma and states that the cause of death was accidental. Guests at the Cecil, now rebranded as Stay on Main, sued the hotel over the incident, and Lamb's parents filed a separate suit later that year, the latter was dismissed in 2015. 22. Ricky McCormick's Encrypted Notes McCormick was a high school dropout who had held multiple addresses in the Missouri, Illinois region in St. Louis, Beauville, and Fairview Heights, sometimes living off and on with his elderly mother. According to a 1999 article in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, McCormick suffered from chronic heart and lung problems. He was not married, but had fathered at least four children. He had a criminal record, and had previously served 11 months of a three-year sentence for statutory rape. At the time of his death, he was 41 years old, unemployed, and on disability. McCormick's body was found on June 30, 1999 near West Alton, Missouri cornfield by a woman driving along a field road off Route 367. The reason he was 15 miles away from his current address is another mystery, as he did not own a car and the area is not served by public transportation. Though the body had already somewhat decomposed, authorities used fingerprints to identify McCormick. There was no indication that anyone had a motive to kill McCormick and no one had reported him missing, so the authorities initially ruled out homicide, but no cause of death was officially determined at the time. McCormick was last seen alive five days earlier, on June 25, 1999, getting a checkup at St. Louis now defunct Forest Park Hospital, 21. Bear Brook Murders The Bear Brook Murders also referred to as the Allenstown Four, are four unidentified female murder victims discovered in 1985 and 2000 at Bear Brook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire. The case has never been solved. All of the victims were either partially or completely skeletonized, they're believed to have died between 1977 and 1985. The victims' faces have been reconstructed multiple times most recently by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. On November 10, 1985, a hunter found a 55-gallon metal drum near the site of a burnt-down store. Inside were the bodies of an adult female and young girl. The remains had been wrapped in plastic, possibly a garbage bag. Autopsies determined both had died of blunt trauma, they were later buried in the same grave. On May 9, 2000, 
the remains of two young girls were found near the first discovery site. The bodies were also in a 55-gallon metal drum. The cause of death for these children has not been determined. The woman may have had Caucasian and Native American heritage. She had curly or wavy brown hair and was between 5 feet 2 inches and 5 feet 7 inches. Her teeth showed significant dental work, including multiple fillings and three tooth extractions. The three girls may have also had Native American heritage, with light or white complexions. The girl found with the adult female was between 5 and 11 years old. She had symptoms of pneumonia, a crooked front tooth, earrings in each ear, and was between 4 feet 3 inches and 4 feet 6 inches tall. Her hair was wavy and light brown, unlike the woman, she had no dental fillings. She had a gap in her front teeth. The second youngest girl, age estimated between 2 to 4 years old, also had a gap in her front teeth. She had brown hair and was about 3 feet 8 inches tall. She had an overbite, which was probably noticeable. The youngest girl, estimated age 1 to 3 years old had long blonde or light brown hair, was between 2 feet 1 inch and 2 feet 6 inches inches tall, and had a gap in her front teeth 20. Little Lord Fauntleroy, Murder Victim On March 8, 1921, the remains of a boy aged 5 to 7 were found floating in a pond near the O'Loughlin Stone Company in Waukesha, Waukesha County, Wisconsin. He had been struck with a blunt instrument and was then disposed of in the local body of water. Despite having been dressed in clothing that seemed to indicate an affluent background, the boy was claimed by no one. In efforts to identify him, authorities displayed his body at a local funeral home. A reward of $1,000 was also posted, but did not generate any information. His clothes consisted of a grey sweater, muncing underwear, black stockings, a blouse and leather shoes. He had blonde hair, brown eyes and a tooth missing from the lower jaw. The boy could have been in the water for several months. In 1949, a medical examiner from Milwaukee, Wisconsin suggested that investigators felt there may have been a connection between the unidentified boy and Homer Lemay, a six-year-old who disappeared around the same time the child died. Lemay was said by his father, Edmund, to have died in a vehicle accident during a trip to South America when he was being cared for by family friends, described as the Nortons, but there was no existing record of his death. Edmund Lemay stated that he learned of his son's death after receiving information from a South American newspaper that detailed the accident. He almost was accused of falsifying his wife's signature while she was missing, but was later found not guilty. Detectives were unable to find any information about such an event or even the existence of the two Nortons. 19. Garnell Monroe Moore vanished in 2002 at age 7. Seven-year-old Garnell was last seen in Baltimore, Maryland in August of 2002. He was residing with his aunt, Belinda Cash. One of Garnell's great-aunts, Trina Morton, who was nine months pregnant at the time, recalls seeing him playing outside of Belinda's home. Trina made arrangements for Garnell to visit her the next weekend, but she went into labor and couldn't see him and asked Belinda if she could reschedule the visit, but Belinda told her that it was an inconvenient time because she was in the process of moving. Garnell has not been seen or heard from since. Garnell's parents never raised him, his mother is incarcerated and his father leads a transient lifestyle. During his early years, Garnell lived with his paternal relatives in the 3700 block of Harlem Avenue located on the west side of Baltimore. Belinda, who was childless, took Garnell into her home when he was six years old. The living arrangement was informal and Belinda never had legal custody of him. Garnell was never enrolled in school and never came into any contact with social service agencies. Garnell's relatives didn't realize that he had disappeared until June of 2005 when they found Belinda and asked where Garnell was. Belinda said that Garnell was away on a school field trip to Virginia, but school wasn't in session at the time and he wasn't an enrolled student. Garnell's family contacted authorities, who interviewed Belinda, 
who stated that she no longer wanted to care for Garnell anymore, so she left him on the steps of a social services building in the 500 block of North Hilton Street near Redmondson Avenue located in West Baltimore. During the police investigation, authorities discovered the address that Belinda gave them wasn't real. They searched the residence where Belinda resided in 2000 to see if Garnell was left behind there, but they didn't find any evidence as to his whereabouts. Belinda has no known history of child abuse and no significant criminal record. The circumstances surrounding Garnell's disappearance is considered murky, but authorities don't believe that he has met with any harm, but they're concerned about Garnell's safety and want to verify his well-being. 18. Who put Bella in the White Chelm? On April 18, 1943, four local boys, Robert Hart, Thomas Willits, Bob Farmer and Fred Payne, were poaching in Hagley Wood near to Whitesbury Hill when they came across a large white chelm. Notes the wood is part of the Hagley estate belonging to Lord Cabin. Thinking it a good place to hunt birds' nests, Farmer attempted to climb the tree to investigate. As he climbed, he glanced down into the hollow trunk and discovered a skull. At first he believed it to be that of an animal, but after seeing human hair and teeth, he realized that he had found a human skull. As they were on the land illegally, Farmer put the skull back and all four boys returned home without mentioning their discovery to anybody. The skull of Wychelm Bella, as retrieved April 18, 1943. On returning home, the youngest of the boys, Tommy Willits, felt uneasy about what he had witnessed and decided to report the find to his parents. When police checked the trunk of the tree they found an almost complete skeleton, with a shoe, a gold wedding ring, and some fragments of clothing. After further investigation, the remains of a hen were found some distance from the tree. The body was sent for forensic examination by Professor James Webster. He quickly established that it was that of a female who had been dead for at least 18 months, placing time of death in or before October 1941. Webster also discovered a section of taffeta in her mouth, suggesting that she had died from suffocation. From the measurement of the trunk in which the body had been discovered, he also deduced that she must have been placed there still warm after the killing, as she could not have fit once rigor mortis had taken hold. Since the country was then in the midst of World War II, identification was seriously hampered. Police could tell from items found with the body what the woman had looked like, but with so many people reported missing during the war, records were too vast for a proper identification to take place. Citation needed, the current location of her skeleton is unknown, as is that of the autopsy report. The Littleton Arms, Hagley. In a Radio 4 program first broadcast in August 2014 Steve Punt suggested two possible victims. The first possibility came from a statement made to police in 1953 by Una Mossop, in which she said that her cousin Jack Mossop had confessed to family members that he and a Dutchman called Van Ralt had put the woman in the tree. Mossop and Van Ralt met for a drink at the Littleton Arms, a pub in Hagley. With Van Ralt was a Dutch woman. Later that night, Mossop said the woman became drunk, and passed out while they were driving. The men put her in a hollow tree in the woods in the hope that in the morning she would wake up and be frightened into seeing the error of her ways. Jack Mossop was confined to a Stafford Mental Hospital, because he had reoccurring dreams of a woman staring out at him from a tree. He died in the hospital before the body in the watch elm was found. 5. The likelihood of this being the correct explanation is questioned because Una Mossop did not come forward with this information until more than 10 years after Jack Mossop's death. A second possible victim was reported to the police in 1944 by a Birmingham prostitute. In the report she stated that another prostitute called Bella, who worked on the Hagley Road, had disappeared about three years previously. 17. Hintercave Murders Hinterkaft was a small farmstead situated between the Bavarian towns of Ingolstadt and Schrobenhausen, approximately 70 kilometers, 43 miles, north of Munich. On the evening of March 31, 1922, the six inhabitants of the farm were killed with the mattock. The murders remain unsolved. 
The six victims were the farmer Andreas Gruber and his wife Casilia, their widowed daughter Victoria Gabriel, Victoria's children, Casilia and Joseph, and the maid, Maria Baumgartner Hinterkaft was never an official place name. The name was used for the remote farmstead of the hamlet of Kaft, located nearly 1 km miles, north of the main part of Kaft and hidden in the woods. The prefix Hinter, part of many German place names, means behind, part of the town of Wangen, which was incorporated into Wehefun in 1971. 16. Long Island Serial Killer Long Island Serial Killer also referred to by media sources as the Gilgo Beach Killer or the Craigslist Stripper, is an American unidentified suspected serial killer who is believed to have murdered 10 to 16 people associated with the sex trade over a period of nearly 20 years and dumped their bodies along the Ocean Parkway, near the remote Long Island, New York Beach towns of Gilgo Beach and Oak Beach in Suffolk County and the area of Jones Beach State Park in Nassau County. The remains of four victims were found in December 2010, while six more sets of remains were found in March and April 2011. Police believe that the latest sets of remains predate the four bodies found in December 2010. On May 9, 2011, authorities surmised that two of the newest sets of remains might be the work of a second killer. On November 29, 2011, however, the police announced that they believe that one person is responsible for all 10 deaths and that they did not believe that the case of Shannon Gilbert, an escort who was missing when the first set of bodies were found, was related. It is clear that the area in and around Gilgo Beach has been used to discard human remains for some period of time, said Suffolk County District Attorney Thomas Spoda. 15. Uggsman of New Orleans Digsman of New Orleans was a serial killer active in New Orleans, Louisiana, and surrounding communities, including Gretna, Louisiana, from May 1918 to October 1919. Press reports during the height of public panic about the killings mentioned similar murders as early as 1911, but recent researchers have called these reports into question. As the killer's epithet implies, the victims usually were attacked with an axe which often belonged to the victims themselves. In most cases, a panel on a back door of a home was removed by a chisel, which were both left on the floor near the door, followed by an attack on one or more of the residents with either an axe or straight razor. The crimes were not robberies, and the perpetrator never removed items from his victims' homes. The majority of the Eggsman's victims were Italian-American, leading many to believe that the crimes were racially motivated. Many media outlets sensationalized this aspect of the crimes, even suggesting mafia involvement despite lack of evidence. Some crime analysts have suggested that the killings were related to sex, and that the murderer was perhaps a sadist seeking female victims. Criminologists Colin and Damon Wilson hypothesized that the Eggsman killed male victims only when they obstructed his attempts to murder women, supported by cases in which the woman of the household was murdered but not the man. A less plausible theory is that the killer committed the murders in an attempt to promote jazz music, suggested by a letter attributed to the killer in which he stated that he would spare the lives of those who play jazz in their homes. Digsman was not caught or identified, and his crime spree stopped as mysteriously as it had started. The murderer's identity remains unknown to this day, although various possible identifications of varying plausibility have been proposed. On March 13, 1919, a letter purporting to be from the Eggsman was published in newspapers saying that he would kill again at 15 minutes past midnight on the night of March 19, but would spare the occupants of any place where a jazz band was playing. That night all of New Orleans dance halls were filled to capacity, and professional and amateur bands played jazz at parties at hundreds of houses around town. There were no murders that night. Not everyone was intimidated by the Eggsman. Some alarmed citizens submitted announcements to newspapers challenging the Eggsman to visit their houses. One promised to leave a window open for the Eggsman, politely asking that he not damage the front door. 14. Ken Rex McElroy Ken Rex McElroy, June 1, 1934, July 10, 1981, was a resident of Skidmore, Nodaway County, Missouri. Known as the town bully, 
his unsolved killing became the focus of international attention. Over the course of his life McElroy was accused of dozens of felonies, including assault, child molestation, statutory rape, arson, hog and cattle rustling, and burglary. In all, he was indicted 21 times, but escaped conviction each time, except for the last. In 1981, McElroy was convicted of shooting and seriously injuring the town's 70-year-old grocer, Ernest Bobonecam, the previous year. McElroy successfully appealed the conviction and was released on bond, after which he engaged in an ongoing harassment campaign against Bonecamp, the town's Church of Christ minister, and others who were sympathetic to Bonecamp. He appeared in a local bar, the DNG Tavern, armed with an M1 Garin rifle and bayonet, and later threatened to kill Bonecamp. The next day, McElroy was shot to death in broad daylight as he sat with his wife Trina in his pickup truck on Skidmore's Main Street. He was struck by bullets from at least two different firearms, in front of a crowd of people estimated as between 30 and 46. To date, no one has been charged in connection with McElroy's death. 13. Oakland County Child Killer During a 13-month period, four children were abducted and murdered with their bodies left in various locations within the county. The children were each held from 4 to 19 days before being killed. Their deaths triggered a murder investigation which at the time was the largest in U.S. history. The murders are still unsolved. Fear and near mass hysteria swept southeastern Michigan as young people were inundated with information on stranger danger and parents clogged streets around schools dropping off and picking up their children. The few who did walk walk in groups and under the watchful eyes of parents in safe houses, where children could go if they felt uncomfortable. Children even avoided using a playground directly behind the Birmingham police station. One incident in Livonia involved a tow truck driver who assaulted a man he had seen asking two boys on the street for directions. He turned out to be a tar salesman on a business trip from Akron, Ohio, who had got lost with no knowledge of the slayings. Citation needed, the Detroit News offered a $100,000 reward for the killer's apprehension. Detroit's two daily newspapers, as well as the area's numerous radio and television stations, aggressively covered the case. A presentation on Xeet, entitled Winter's Fear, The Children, The Killer, The Search, won a 1977 Peabody Award, 12. Nathaniel Barjona. In late March 1975, Barjona, impersonating a police officer, abducted eight-year-old Richard O'Connor while he was on his way to school, then proceeded to sexually assault and strangle him. A neighbor, looking out of her window, observed the abduction and notified authorities, who began searching for the boy. A patrol car later observed a car matching that used in the abduction parked far away from mothers in a parking lot, and after calling for backup, ordered Barjona out of the car. O'Connor was found in the car bloodied, having defecated and urinated on himself from the sexual assault, and near the point of death. A few days before his high school graduation, Barjona drove to nearby Hartford, Connecticut, and, impersonating a police officer, abducted a nine-year-old girl, whom he savagely assaulted in the car. After the child began vomiting and convulsing from the assault, he drove up to a sidewalk and threw the girl out of the car. A nearby witness saw the incident and got his license plate, leading to his arrest. This assault never got back to Bar Jonah's probation officer, and he was released from parole in May 1976 for his earlier abduction and sexual assault of an eight-year-old boy. When Barjona's probationary period was over, he received a letter thanking him for his cooperation. On September 24, 1977, Barjona, claiming to be an undercover FBI agent, convinced two boys coming out of White City Cinemas in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts to enter his vehicle. Barjona then transported the boys to a secluded area, where he handcuffed then proceeded to strangle and flick cigarette ashes upon them. After jumping repeatedly on the chest of one of the boys, the 375-pound Barjona believed he had killed him, then drove off with the other still alive in his trunk. However, the boy regained consciousness and managed to find help, 
leading shortly thereafter to Barjona's arrest, the other boy was found, still alive, in his trunk. For this crime, he was convicted of attempted murder and received the maximum sentence of 18 to 20 years in prison. While in prison he was transferred to the Bridgewater State Hospital. 7. On March 22, 1984, he changed his name to Nathaniel Benjamin Levi Barjona. He gave several reasons for changing his name. Barjona told friends and relatives that he changed his name because he wanted to know what it was like to be discriminated against and persecuted as a Jew. 8. During a later interview with Dr. Michael Stone for the television show Most Evil, he claimed he was Jewish and wanted his name to reflect that. Later in the same year, Superior Court Judge Walter E. Steele ruled that Massachusetts had failed to prove that Barjona was dangerous 7 and he was released before moving to Great Falls, Montana. 7. During this time, Barjona confided in his psychiatrist that he had a deep fascination and curiosity with the taste of human flesh, and had innumerable murderous fantasies. On August 9, 1991, just a month after being released from Bridgewater State Hospital, Barjona observed a seven-year-old boy sitting alone in a car outside of a post office in Oxford, Massachusetts. Barjona, who weighed 275 pounds at the time of the incident, entered the vehicle and sat on the boy, thrusting his mass atop the boy's fragile chest. Some witnesses, along with the boy's mother, observed the event and ran to the boy's rescue, causing Barjona to flee. An officer recognized Barjona's description from over 15 years earlier, and he was later arrested for the attack. At first, Barjona claimed that he entered the car to get out of the rain, but later admitted that he intended to kill the boy. For the attack, Barjona was sentenced to probation in Montana. 11. Brabant Killers The Brabant Killers, also the Nivels Gang, Dutch, the Ben Van Nijvel, French, Les Tours du Brabant, are believed responsible for a series of violent attacks that mainly occurred in the Belgian province of Brabant between 1982 and 1985. 28 people died and 40 were injured. It's considered Belgium's most notorious unsolved crime spree. The identities and whereabouts of the Brabant killers are unknown. One may have been killed after the last known robbery. Failure to catch the gang was a major impetus behind reform of the Belgian police. There have been many theories about the case and those involved. One says the perpetrators may have been a particularly psychopathic group of criminals without any ulterior motive. A second theory asserts a politically extreme paramilitary group conducted undercover surveillance on security at some of the targeted supermarkets. 10. Boy in the Box, Philadelphia in February 1957, the boy's body, wrapped in a plaid blanket, was found in the woods off Susquehanna Road in Fox Chase, Philadelphia. The naked body was inside a cardboard box which had once contained a bassinet of the kind sold by J.C. Penney. The boy's hair had been recently cropped, possibly after death, as clumps of hair clung to the body. There were signs of severe malnourishment as well as surgical scars on the ankle and groin, and an L-shaped scar under the chin. The body was first discovered by a young man who was checking his muskrat traps. Fearing that the police would confiscate his traps, he did not report what he had found. A few days later, a college student spotted a rabbit running into the underbrush. Knowing that there were animal traps in the area, he stopped his car to investigate and discovered the body. He too was reluctant to have any contact with the police, but he did report his find the following day. 9. Atlas Vampire The Atlas Vampire was an unknown assailant who committed the unsolved vampire murder, also known as the Vampire Murder Case, in Stockholm, Sweden in 1932. On May 4, 1932, a 32-year-old prostitute, Lily Lindström was found murdered in her small apartment in the Atlas area of Stockholm near St. Eric's Plan. She had been dead for two to three days before police broke into her apartment, she had suffered blunt force trauma to her head. Lily was found completely naked and faced down on her bed. According to reports sexual activity had taken place, with a condom found to still be protruding from her anus. 
the detectives noted that a gravy ladle was found at the scene and on further inspection of the body, they realized her body had been drained of some, if not all, of her blood. Police suspected the implement was used by the perpetrator to drink Clearly's blood. Various clients fell under suspicion but after a lengthy investigation, none were charged with her murder. The murder remains unsolved. 8. Disappearance of Amy Lynn Bradley On the morning of March 24, 1998, Bradley had been drinking in the dance club with the ship's band, Blue Orchid. One of the band's members, Alistair Douglas, known as Yellow, said he parted with Bradley at about 1 a.m. Sometime between 5.15 and 5.30 a.m., Bradley's father, Ron, saw her asleep on the cabin balcony. When he got up at 6 a.m., she was no longer there. He later said, I left to try and go up and find her. When I couldn't find her, I didn't really know what to think, because it was very much unlike Amy to leave and not tell us where she was going. The ship was en route to Cura's Out, Antilles, at the time she was last seen. The ship docked in Cura's Out shortly after she was discovered missing. Extensive searches on the ship and at sea produced no signs of her whereabouts. Bradley was a trained lifeguard and investigators said there was no evidence that she had fallen overboard or committed suicide. There were possible settings of Bradley and Curazao in 1998 and 1999. Two Canadian tourists reported seeing a woman resembling Amy on a beach in Curazao in August 1998. The woman's tattoos were reportedly identical to Bradley's. Bradley's tattoos included a Tasmanian devil spinning a basketball located on her shoulder, the sun placed on her lower back, a Chinese symbol located on her right ankle, and the gecko lizard on her navel. She also had a navel ring. A member of the Navy claimed that he saw Bradley in a brothel in 1999. He claimed she told him that her name was Amy Bradley and, she, begged him for help, explaining that she was not allowed to leave. There was another potential sighting in 2005, when a witness claimed to have seen Bradley in a department store restroom in Barbados. Bradley's mother and father appeared on the November 17, 2005, episode of Dr. Phil. An image of a young woman resembling Bradley that was emailed to her parents was shown on the show, and it suggests that she might have been sold into sexual slavery. There is a $260,000 reward for information leading to Bradley's return. Her case has been featured by America's Most Wanted 8, and by the television show Vanished. Renewed attention was paid to her case after the disappearance of Natalie Holloway in 2005. 7. Saw the Children Disappearance On Christmas Eve, December 24, 1945, a fire destroyed the Sawyer home in Fayetteville. West Virginia, United States. At the time, it was occupied by George Sauter, his wife Jenny, and nine of their ten children. During the fire, George, Jenny, and four of the nine children escaped. The bodies of the other five children were never found. The Sauters believed for the rest of their lives that the five missing children survived. The Sauters never rebuilt the house, instead converting the site into a memorial garden to their lost children. In the 1950s, as they came to doubt that the children had perished, they put up a billboard as the site along State Route 16 with pictures of the five, offering a reward for information that would bring closure to the case. It remained up until shortly after Jenny Sauter's death in the late 1980s. In support of their belief that the children survived, the Sauters have pointed to a number of unusual circumstances before and during the fire. George disputed the fire department's finding that the blaze was electrical in origin, noting that he had recently had the house rewired and inspected. He and his wife suspected arson, leading to theories that the children had been taken by the Sicilian Mafia, perhaps in retaliation for George's outspoken criticism of Benito Mussolini and the fascist government of his native Italy. State and federal efforts to investigate the case further in the early 1950s yielded no new information. The family did, however, later receive what may have been a picture of one of the boys as an adult during the 1960s. Their one surviving daughter, along with their grandchildren, have continued to publicize the case in the 21st century in the media and online. 6. 
the secrets as the Maltese Club. Samberg was an elderly man who worked and owned a Maltese cafe. He had been known to gamble and had sums of money floating around the place. Further into the investigation, 100 euros was found hidden in Borg's mattress. Sam Borg was a Maltese man in his 60s when a friend noticed he hadn't been around for a few days. The last sighting of Sam had been on the 30th of May, 1960. The police were notified that Sam was missing and later that case was looked into. Sam was found upstairs in his own home dead, with major head wounds. The head wound showed that Sam had been beaten to death. The door of which he was in had been nailed shut by the murderer leaving his, her only exit and entry through the skylight in that room. Still to this day the crime is a big mystery with next to no evidence or suspects. This case was known as, the secrets as the Maltese Club. There were absolutely no witnesses in this crime other than Sam's friend noticing he was missing and had not been seen for a few days. The murder took place during the night so no one was around to witness the incident. Five. Highway of Tears. The Highway of Tears murders is a series of murders and disappearances of mainly Aboriginal women along the 720 kilometers, 450 miles, section of Highway 16 between Prince George and Prince Rupert, British Columbia, Canada from 1969 until 2011. Highway 16 is Northern British Columbia's East West Corridor, extending from Jasper in the east to Prince Rupert in the west. This route is a section of the Trans-Canada Yellowhead Highway, also known as the Park to Park Highway, which spans across British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. There are numerous municipalities and 23 First Nations communities that border the Highway of Tears. The region is plagued with poverty and lack of public transportation, forcing its occupants to turn to hitchhiking as a form of transit. Police list the number of Highway 16 victims at 19, but estimates by Aboriginal organizations range into the 40s, largely because they include women who disappeared a greater distance from the highway. 13 of the 19 victims were teenagers while 10 out of the 19 victims were women of Aboriginal descent. To date, only one murder has been solved, for which serial killer Cody Lejbikoff was convicted, although American serial rapist and suspected serial killer Bobby Jack Fowler, who died while imprisoned in the United States for other crimes, is a suspect in many of the murders. Authorities have persons of interest in several other cases, but insufficient evidence to press charges. 4. Chicago Totten All Murders the Chicago Tylenol murders were a series of poisoning deaths resulting from drug tampering in the Chicago metropolitan area in 1982. The victims had all taken Tylenol branded acetaminophen capsules that had been laced with potassium cyanide. A total of seven people died in the original poisonings, with several more deaths in subsequent copycat crimes. The incidents led to reforms in the packaging of over-the-counter substances and to federal anti-tampering laws. The actions of Johnson & Johnson to reduce deaths and warn the public of poisoning risks has been widely praised as an exemplary response to such a crisis. No suspect was ever charged or convicted of the poisonings. New York City resident James William Lewis was considered the prime suspect and was convicted of extortion for sending a letter to Johnson & Johnson that took credit for the deaths and demanded $1 million to stop them. 3. G.R.G. Markov Secret Umbrella Murder G.R.G. Ivanov Markov, Bulgarian, March 1, 1929, September 11, 1978, was a Bulgarian dissident writer. Markov originally worked as a novelist and playwright in his native country, then governed by a communist regime under Chairman Todor Zhivkov, until his defection from Bulgaria in 1969. After relocating, he worked as a broadcaster and journalist for the BBC World Service, the US-funded Radio Free Europe, and Germany's Deutsche Welle. Markov used such forums to conduct a campaign of sarcastic criticism against the incumbent Bulgarian regime, which, according to his wife at the time of death, eventually became vitriolic and included really smearing mud on the people in the inner circles. 
he was assassinated on a London street by a micro-engineer pellet containing ricin, fired into his leg via an umbrella wielded by someone associated with the Bulgarian secret police. It has been speculated that they asked the KGB for help, too. San Francisco Satanic Beheading On February 8, 1981 transient Leroy Carter Jr. was sleeping rough in the Golden Gate Park, San Francisco when he was brutally attacked. After police arrived at the grisly scene the next day they noted that Carter's head had been cut off. And also that it was missing. One of the only clues left behind at the scene was a headless chicken, part of which had been stuffed into Carter's body at the neck. Quickly realizing that this case needed a specialist, the San Francisco police brought in an officer Sandy Galland who specialized in the occult and satanic murders. According to Galland, the murder was likely part of a dark ritual involving Palomelum, a black magic offshoot of the religion Santeria. Gallant believed whoever had committed the crime did so to make a ritual brew from Carter's brains and perhaps the ears and the nose. She also predicted that the head would be returned after 42 days, once the ritual was complete. True enough, right on schedule the head was returned to the crime 42 days later. However, despite having been called in, the occult detective was not taken seriously, and no one was watching the crime scene to make the arrest. The murderer escaped justice and the case remains unsolved. 1. Terror Calico On June 15, 1989, a Polaroid photo of an unidentified young woman and a boy, both gagged and seemingly bound, was found in the parking lot of a convenience store in Port Street Joe, Florida. The woman who found that photo said that it was found in a parking space where a white windowless Toyota cargo van had been parking when she arrived at the store. She said that the van was being driven by a man with a mustache believed to be in his 30s. Police set up roadblocks to intercept the vehicle, but the man was never caught or identified. According to Polaroid officials, the picture had to have been taken after May 1989 because the particular film used in the photograph was not available until then. The photo was broadcast on a current affair in July, and Dole was contacted by friends who had seen the show and thought the woman resembled Calico. Relatives of Michael Henley, also of New Mexico, who had disappeared in April 1988, saw the episode and said they believed he was the boy in the photo. Dole and Henley's parents both met with investigators and examined the Polaroid. Dole said she was convinced it was her daughter after taking time, growth and lack of makeup into consideration. She also noted that a scar on the woman's leg was identical to one Calico had received in a car accident. In addition, a paperback copy of V.C. Andrews' My Sweet Audrina, said to be one of Calico's favorite books, can be seen lying next to the woman. Scotland Yard analyzed the photo and concluded that the woman was Calico, but the second analysis by the Los Alamos National Laboratory disagreed. An FBI analysis of the photo was inconclusive. Henley's mother said she was almost certain it was Michael in the Polaroid. The identification of the boy in this photograph as Henley is considered unlikely. His remains were discovered in 1990 in the Zuni Mountains, about 7 miles, 11 kilometers, from his family's campsite from which he had disappeared, and 75 miles, 121 kilometers, from where Calico disappeared. Police believe that Henley wandered off and died of exposure. Twenty years after the Polaroid photo was found and shared by the media, pictures of a boy were sent to the Port Street Joe Police Chief, David Barnes. He received two letters, postmarked June 10th and August 10, 2009, from Albuquerque, New Mexico. One letter contained a photo, printed on copy paper, of a young boy with sandy brown hair. Someone had drawn a black band and ink on the photo, over the boy's mouth, as if it were covered in tape as in the 1989 picture. The second letter contained an original image of the boy. On August 12th, the Star newspaper in Port Street Joe received a third letter, also postmarked in Albuquerque on August 10th and depicting the same image, of a boy with black marker drawn over his mouth. The boy has not been confirmed to be the same one as in the previous photo. 
none of the letters contained a return address or a note indicating the child's identity, making the officials there believe it may have something to do with the disappearance of Terror Calico. Why? The letters were sent at the same time that the self-proclaimed psychic called about Calico, saying she had met a runaway in California with whom she worked in a strip club, this girl was eventually murdered. The caller said she had dreams suggesting the runaway may have been Calico and that she may be buried in California. Searches did not lead to any discoveries. The photos were given to the FBI for further investigation in hope of finding fingerprints or possible DNA evidence. Two other Polaroid photographs, possibly of Calico, have surfaced over the years, but they have yet to be released to the public. The first was found near a construction site in Montecito, California, and is a blurry photo of a girl's face with tape covering her mouth, and light blue striped fabric behind her, similar to that on the pillow in the Toyota van photo. It was taken on film that was not available until June 1989. The second shows a woman loosely bound in gauze, her eyes covered with more gauze and large black framed glasses, with a male passenger beside her on an Amtrak train. The film used was not available until February 1990. Calico's mother believed the first one was Tara, but thought the second may have been a gag. Her sister stated, they had a striking, uncombing resemblance. As for me, I will not rule them out. But keep in mind our family has had to identify many other photographs and all but those three were ruled out.